Good morning, family. <laughs> morning. Everybody have a good week? Yes. Well, thanks for participating. <laughs> yes, it was an excellent week. Perfect, perfect. Well, this morning, let's, uh, let's make a uh, point. Hello, can you hear me? This morning, let's make it a, a point to, to become a woman with the Lord. Let's, uh, let's not have a church service. Let's have a time of intimacy with our Father and, and fall deeper in love with Him. The closer we are to God, the more, the more of this world is going to disappear. The worldly ways that we disappear out of our lives. If we uh, grasp the Christ like a whole lot of times, Thank you. I think that's taking too long. How many times are we fast to get short and angry with someone or something or situation? Um, when, when we're told that we know we're not in control, but we have to believe that and give everything that we battle with to God. So this morning, let's let's make it a point to get close to Him and, and just fall deeper in love and really feel His presence this morning.
that Father, that there will truly be a transformation right here today for your glory in Jesus' name. Good morning. Woo! There we go. All right, all right, all right. Guess what, folks? As good as it is, God's got a plan to just let it get good and good. You up for it? I think I think it is fun to be a child of God. You know, I know that the world for many years told me I was out there having fun, but I really didn't know what fun was until I met Jesus. And you know what? It, it just continues to change. I've, uh, I'm anxious about sharing with you today. And it's actually some things that I've shared with you a little bit in, in uh, some of the other. I still got a pretty good ring on this. Can we back off a little bit? So there's a... Uh, I want to talk to you today actually about the mind and the body 
And uh, that'll, as I go through some of this, you'll understand where I'm coming from with just a little bit more. But I love those songs we just sang. Oh my gosh, that was that was so good, so rewarding and refreshing. And I'm thankful for Amber and Drew for putting the time in to bring these things in. And I know that they, I know that that's one of the things that they're in prayer all week to just to get ready for Sunday to know what to bring and all that. And so, and they spoke to me today. You know what? We sat there, and I love that first one where it says, nothing is better than you. And you know what? No thing on the face of this earth is better than the relationship that you can have with your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Nothing. And so into that, so it goes right in, and then we're saying about uh, Jesus, the name above all names. And you know, and I, and I love that. You know, His, uh, his name is powerful. And the power that comes in the name of Jesus is the very power that made it possible for you to be called children of God. And so I'm so thankful that for these songs that speak to us like this. And you know, and it says that there is a being power to be born again. You know what? When you're born again, it means you're you're a fresh start. But do you know when I I received Jesus as my Lord and Savior in 19, November of 1985. But in the reality, when it came to it, I am still every day fresh in being a child of God. His mercies are fresh and new every day. Every day. And so I need to recognize that within my life. So you know what? It doesn't matter where I've been but it does matter in whose I am. And so when I, I, I bring that to, to come into this today because I started sharing with you about four, three or four weeks ago about the gifts of God and, and you know, and how God has created you to be you. But there's many times I have recognized now that we don't always know who we are. Because we've allowed the world to paint a picture of who we are instead of allowing the Word of God to paint a picture of who we are. And so I believe that's very important in where we're going to be going with some of this. But many times the world talks about how, and the Word talks about, it says that this is a generation that seeks after miracles. But he says you will receive none because you need to seek after the Lord. He's got to be first and foremost into your life. And whenever we begin to recognize that, it will begin to change everything about how we do life. That's the only way, if whenever, whenever Christ is first in your life, you're going to start to find out who you really are. Because there's going to be a new picture that happens within your life. Now, I've been talking, uh, last week I shared a little bit about the renewing of the mind. In fact, I left you with a challenge about how, how do you know that your mind is being renewed? And, I, and I've, I've sat and I've looked, I've gone on the computer and I've looked up a lot of these different teachings from all over the country, different perspectives and all that. And I can see, well, there's, uh, I find a list of seven ways to know that your mind is being renewed. And then you look a little further, 12 ways of knowing your mind, 21 ways of knowing, and the list just goes on and on. And I can tell you this, as long as you be, breathe breath on the face of this earth, you have an opportunity for transformation to happen into your life to be like Jesus. And that needs to be a goal in your life this transformation. And we'll look at that just a little bit more. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself on this, but I want to turn it in the book of Matthew chapter six. And as you turn there, I just want to go ahead. Father, I just want to come before you today and I want to thank you for your presence with us. Father, I thank you that, Father, you said that you, you would be here in the midst where we'd gather together in your name. And Father, I just know that, Father, in your presence, lives change. So, Father, I open up 
my heart and my mind right now today. And Father, I pray this over everybody that's here and everybody that's listening online, that Father, that we can bind up the spirit of the unclouded mind or of a clouded mind. That Father, that we can release the spirit of a renewed mind within each and every one of us. That Father, that we can truly be more like Jesus. You said that we were uh, formed in his image. And so, Father, today, I just ask that Holy Spirit bring change into our lives. For we know that when you bring change, it's always good and it's always preparing us for more to come. So, Lord, right here today, thank you for the victory we have in Jesus. Amen. Matthew chapter 6. Now, Matthew chapter 6, these are scriptures that are very well known to everybody. In fact, you can... Hear him, you probably heard it quoted before you when you was first learning to talk, and you can probably and you begin to learn to say this. And so, and it talks about the Lord's Prayer, and it talks about what is called the Lord's Prayer here, but it's actually the, the prayer, a model prayer that, that Jesus was teaching his disciples to pray. And I'm going to go through this pretty quick just to move on. But it says, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come and your will be done. You know what he's saying? First thing I want you to get a hold of is our Father. Our Father. He didn't say my Father. He said our Father. There's that power to be born again, to be children of God that he's already bringing out. But he said that our Father, he, 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 uh, you know, the word teaches us that our father, father is what? He's, he's the father of all creation. Many times we just see him as God that's way off out there and you just want to try to go get closer to him. Well, you know what? He wanted to get closer to you. That's why he sent Jesus. So he became our father when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, but him still being the Lord of all creation, he's not easy. He's a father. He's not just God, but he is God. But he's also very personal with each and every one of us. And he wanted us as his children to have that DNA that comes from him, from his heart, his mind, his attitude to be in each and every one of us. But again, he created you to be you. So you do not have to try to be like somebody else because you see them as being better than you. Because if you're just trying to be like somebody else, then you're trying, then you're living your life as a false attitude. You can never be somebody else. You weren't created to be somebody else, but you are created to be a child of God. And whenever we look at that, it's just going to come into more play as we look at this, but I am, to take, I am to have the heart, the mind, the attitude of that of Jesus. It goes on here and it says, verse 11, it says, give us today our daily bread. What is that? He's a God of provision. He's a father of provision. He wants to bless us. And it says, he's, he's not just a God of provision of more stuff, but he's a God of He's a spiritual father that wants to give you spiritual gifts. He wants to bring the spiritual provision into your life. In fact, he says, I've given you everything that you need for life and godliness. So it's not just spiritual, it's also physical that he wants to bring these good things of the kingdom into your life. It goes on in verse 12, it says, forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. You know what? You know what debt is? Debt is a bondage. And it says that he has set us free. It was for freedom that Christ has set us free. So these bondages do not belong to us. And you know what? Don't give it to somebody else either. Don't place bondage on anybody, but help them be who God created them to be. And it says, forgive us as our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Verse 13, 
Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. What's he saying? He's saying, hey guys, there's going to be a spiritual battle. And in that spiritual battle, you're going to sit there and be careful because it can take away your thought process. It can take away the blessings that I have for you. But recognize the spiritual battle that you're in, but also recognize that you have victory in Jesus. And don't ever let go of that. Don't ever let go of that. But it says, verse 14, here's the key. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive yours. Guess what? Forgiveness is a gift from God. And it came in the form of Jesus Christ. And whenever we begin to recognize that, we can see that, that with the measure of forgiveness that I use, it will also be measured unto me. Forgiveness is a bondage. Unforgiveness is a bondage. Forgiveness is a gift from God. There's transformation happens. The word transformation is going to be key in what you're going to see and hear these next few days. But I can tell you this, it's key in my life every day. I am a work in progress. You are a work in progress. But again, it goes back to with the measure that I use, it's going to be measured unto me. I could go into a bunch with this, but I want to keep moving just a little bit if I can and into Romans, <clears throat> excuse me, in the book of Romans 12. Everybody knows these scriptures as well too. And it says, verse one and two, it says, therefore, I urge you brothers in view of God's mercy. You know what his mercy is? It's his forgiveness. Are you forgiven? If you are a child of God, you are forgiven. But many times we don't live our lives as forgiven beings. Many times we still allow the bondages of the world or the words of people that come from this world to place bondage upon us. But guess what? You've been set free. It says he counts men's sins against him no more. Let's keep going. And it says, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, surrender to him. Holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. So do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Transformation beginning to happen at the renewing of the mind. Transformation. But how do you know that your mind is being renewed? Again, this is something that you need to get along with the Lord and ask yourself, Lord, is my mind being renewed? And I can tell you this, it will not just happen on Sunday morning. It will not just happen because you go to a Bible study or because you read uh, scriptures on Facebook. It's going to be because you dig into an intimate, personal relationship. And what I mean by intimate, that word, if you begin to look at that, it begins to go, okay, Lord, I'm going to surrender my life to you. So into me, you see. Into me, see. And where I am out of order, bring me into order. And he will give you the revelation to be with him. And then what? When you get enter into that relationship, he made you a promise that he'd never leave you and he would not forsake you. Yeah. But he would be with there to continually to build you up. That's hope. That means my best days are not behind me. You ever hear anybody talk about the good old days? Let me tell you something. The good days are ahead of us, not behind us. And so that was pretty good. It says, this is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the patterns of this world. That is huge. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You know what? Uh, when you know that your mind is being 
renewed. When you recognize that within your own life, you're going to begin to see things happen in your life and you're going, oh, I am a display of God's splendor. God's using me to speak to the world to speak to people around you, to speak to what we call the oikos, that circle of influence that you have. You know what? You will influence people around you, either for the advancement of the kingdom of God or for the patterns of this world. There's really only two choices, and the choice is up to you. I'm trying not to wander off too far here. But there's, uh, let me just move on to Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8, this is, uh, Jesus had just fed the 5,000, there's other things going on. And he says, why does this generation ask for a miracle, for miraculous sign? I tell you the truth, no sign will be given to them. What was he beginning to say? He's saying, you have got to engage into the truth of my word. And because you've engaged into the truth of my word, miraculous things will happen in your life. There will be things happen into your life that the world cannot explain because the world does not know him. But it comes into the deal and here, uh, take it up in verse 14, it says, the disciples had forgotten had, had forgotten to bring bread except for the one loaf that they had with them into the boat. And what they're going to the other side and it says, be careful, Jesus warned them, watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. Watch out for what? The patterns of this world, man's thinking. Be careful that you watch out for those things because they will lead you astray. Now, the Pharisees was a very religious group. But God didn't lead us into religion. He led us into relationship with the God of all creation. And it says, and it says so be careful of these patterns of the world and, or the, the yeast or the leaven of the Pharisees. Now, the yeast, is, and I'm going to point this out right quick. It says, the yeast is actually the reasoning and the influence from a foreigner. Remember, you're a child of God. And your reasoning and influence must come from the mind of Christ, not from the patterns of this world. And so he also warns us that there's a thief. And there's a thief that what? He comes to steal, kill, and to destroy. Quoting scripture. But it comes on and it says, what is he trying to steal from you? Three things that I wanted to point out here. First of all, he wants to steal your identity. He doesn't want you to believe that you truly are a child of God. The next one is he's trying to steal your purpose. You see, God created each and every one of you with purpose. And that's a purpose of the advancement of his kingdom. But it's also in a place of unity together with one another. That we meet together. We suck together. That we do things together in the advancement of the kingdom. Now, I'm going to point some of this out just a little bit. I may be getting ahead of myself a little bit. But you know what? The word is very plain that you know what? If, well, let me ask you this way. How many of you kids are in sports or band or... Okay, band, yeah, different sports. You know what? Do you practice? Do you practice? Yeah, okay. If you don't practice, what happens? Say it again. You won't be ready, will you? You're not going to be ready to be the, to be who God, to be what you're supposed to do. You can't fulfill the purpose of being in a band or being on a sports team, or let me put it this way, or being a disciple of Christ if you don't practice. You've got to practice. You've got to put, put it into effect. And the more that you do that, the better you get. Is that true? There's an increase comes. Okay? I sort of got ahead of myself a little bit, but I needed to there. 
And so, because I don't want God to, st- or uh, I don't want the enemy to steal your identity, your purpose, or your destiny in the advancement of the kingdom of God. It comes into the deal that says that you were created for increase in this advancement. And it's in the exercising of this advancement of the kingdom, the revelation that comes from the Father, that you're going to see increase into your life. He said that He give us the ability to gain wealth. Wealth first comes through the wisdom of God, not your pocketbook. But then it brings into the, the, the fullness of life that Jesus Christ died to give you. And you know what? Not only in my life, but in your life, I want everything that Jesus died for, I want to give it to Him. I, I want to hunger and thirst for His Word more today than I did when I first knew Him. Luke, Luke 1 no, I didn't finish that, did I? Be careful. But watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. They discussed this with one another and they said, it is because we have no bread. What were they doing? They're reasoning. They're reasoning from man's point of view. And it says, aware of their discussion, Jesus asked, Why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? This is key. That's reasoning again. Are your hearts hardened? In other words, have they got a big old callus on them that this is the way it's always been? You know what? This has been a generational curse in all my life. Remember, you're born again. You're a new creature. And you got to be view your own life that way. You've got to look to know who you are in Him. And it says, "Do you not? Do you <laughs> do you have eyes but fail to see, and ears but fail to hear? And don't you remember when I broke the five loaves for the five thousand? How many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? Twelve. Sound like increase. Go on and says, and when I broke the seven loaves." For the 4,000, how many basketfuls did you pick up? Seven. You said, well, that wasn't an increase. They had seven to start with, and they had seven when they had gone. But they fed 4,000. That's increase. Yes. And then he said to them, do you still not understand? You were created for increase into your lives. Each and every one of us. Now, my son did something a while ago, and that he made a comment about something. You know, he said, "He said, man, I've been looking at some deals that's about some land and stuff being bought. You know, and he said, man, there's some nice deals out there. And he goes, you know, he said." There's a, this one's a million point four. And he goes, you know, there's no way. And everything. What did you, what is the testimony there? No way. Okay. When we have that attitude, I want to tell you something. We need to go back and take scriptures out because the word, the scripture says in Mark, uh, in Luke one thirty seven, nothing is impossible with God. Do you believe that? And the word also, so what is it, Philippians 4, 13? I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. We think too small. Where do our thoughts come from? They need to come from the renewing of the mind. They need to come from that, you know what? Hey, the word of God that brought me, gave me the ability to become a child of God is all powerful. It can do greater things than I can ever think or imagine. Now, what is in Hebrews 11? In Hebrews 11, verse 6, it says that without faith it is impossible to please God. 
But anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. This is some good news. What an invitation. But what is faith? What is this faith? We begin to look at it, and I'm going to talk just a little bit, but I can just tell you this. It is the truthfulness of God. Okay? The truthfulness of God. And you know what? I am to be committed to it. I surrender my life. If He's first in my life, if He has preeminence in my life, first place, it means that I am committed to Him, but I'm not just committed to Him. I am active in the truth itself. There's that practice again. I've got to be active in the truth. I've got to be active in the faith, the truthfulness of God. Now if I look up at Hebrews 1, it tells us very plainly, it says, now faith is being sure of what you hope for and certain of what you do not see. It may not look like it, but the Word teaches us in 2 Corinthians 4.18, which is the first scripture the Lord ever gave me that I knew came from Him and nowhere else. And He says, so we fix our eyes on the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are temporary, but the things that are unseen are eternal. You are created to live from an eternal state of mind. Jesus did. And we're to have the same mind of that of Christ Jesus. So, let, let me say this. Faith doesn't deny that there's problems. Faith doesn't deny that things come against you. But it denies the problem a place in your life to have influence. Faith denies. I hope you get that. Faith denies a place in my life for the problem to have influence. In other words, I have received something from my Heavenly Father that will far outweigh any situation I may ever walk through. He's given me everything that I need for life and godliness. Mark eleven thirty tells us to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Love the neighbor as yourself. I can tell you this, for some of us that we need a bigger as. We need to learn what it really means to learn to love ourselves as God loved you and sent His Son. For you to walk in the victory of His Son. So as I look at these words, I, I've got to learn to love myself. It means I've got to forgive myself. And sometimes that can be a little tricky because the enemy wants to remind us of everything that we've done wrong. But we need to keep reminding him of everything that Jesus does right. Loving yourself. Many times we've seen in this world that it came to a point to where individuals get to thinking so highly of themselves that they can become very arrogant and very not really approachable by most people. That means they shut themselves off in loving others. And I can tell you this, you cannot love others if you don't love yourself properly. James 4.10 says to humble yourselves before the Lord and He will lift you up. You will be exalted. It's not bad to be exalted when you're exalted by the Lord. Because then he's bringing you into your own, into your true identity of who you are as a child of God. So to be exalted, I need to humble myself. But you need to know what true humility is as well. 
Humility, we could all give definitions and stuff, but I wrote it like this. True humility is not thinking less of yourself, but it's thinking of yourself less. If I'm always thinking about my situations, if I'm always thinking about what's wrong in my life or what's good in my life, if I'm always, if I'm always thinking about myself, that means God's not first in my life. I'm to be thinking of God and others more. How can I be a blessing into somebody else's life? This sort of come up this morning already too, but when you, if you're gonna go out and eat today, be a blessing to the waitresses. Speak life into them. Do what God tells you to do. Be aware that the Holy Spirit wants, to, he doesn't want you just to go sit and be a spiritual fat cat. I remember when, I remember this several, several years ago, whenever the, the cattle exchange first opened, I can remember some of the ladies that were working down there said, because they was opening on Sunday and doing stuff. And they said, man, Sundays are always our worst days for tips. They should be our best days. We should be the head, not the tail. Don't be chinchy. Be a blessing into somebody's life. Okay. First Peter two. First Peter chapter two, and verses nine and ten. You are a chosen people. God chose you before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. That's why he had to send his son Jesus because he knew that you couldn't do it by yourself. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood. Royal priesthood. A holy nation, a people belonging to God that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Are you a child of God? Does my life reflect that? Does your life reflect that? This is part of the renewing of the mind that, you know what, I need to present myself in this world, this dark world, as a child of God. Not as someone just getting by trying to make a living and pay taxes. But I have a purpose. And it's for the advancement of the kingdom of God in the oikos circle of influence that he has given me. That he's given you as well. And so I'm going to take you into John ch chapter 20 right here because I think this is huge, huge, huge. But in John chapter 20, the word actually begins to talk and it's been talking about it. We went through the, the death and the burial of Jesus Christ. And now here in John chapter 20, and we're just gonna look at the, some of these first few verses here. And it says that early the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw the stone that had been moved from the, from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and to the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. You know what his name was? John. Guess who wrote this? John. Watch this. And it says, he went, went to them and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple, John, started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter. Who was that? John. And it said, and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen. Now, I want you to get a hold of this. I'm getting set like I'm ready to run. <laughs> but it goes, it says, he went and looked at the strips of linen lying there but he did not go in. 
Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there. That's the linen that was wrapped around the body of Jesus. This is key. He saw the strips of linen as well as the burial cloth that had been that had been around Jesus's head the cloth was folded up and it was folded up by itself separate from the linen now I want you to pay attention to what's going on he is saying in these scriptures right here the wrappings the linen that was wrapped around the head of Jesus was folded up and set aside in a separate place but the linen that was wrapped around the body of Jesus was still lying there. Okay? Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. Now, what did he see? I want to point the first thing out to you. The cloth that had been folded and put inside its head that had been wrapped around the head of Jesus was put in a special place, was put in, in its proper place. What does that mean? It means the head has done everything that it had to do and it was finished. Now, what about the linen that was wrapped around his body? It was still lying there because the body is still waiting to be revealed. Guess what? You, as children, are called to be the body of Christ. Waiting for the body to be revealed. Guess what? Is the body of Christ being revealed in my life? Is the body of Christ being revealed in your life? But let me tell you this. This is of utmost importance. The body is to be submitted to the head. It must live in conformity with the head. Okay? Okay, I thought that was really good. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 27 tells us plainly, you are the body of Christ and each one of you has its part. Guess what? You are vitally important for the advancement of the kingdom of God. This is the body in conformity with the mind of Christ. So how do I know that I'm being renewed? I can see the conformity of the mind of Christ expressed within my life. Okay, 1 Corinthians. You know what? Our battery ran out and our clock up there, so I have no idea what time it is. So y'all just get ready. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, if I can find this again. First Corinthians chapter two, I'm gonna look at verse seven. We'll take it up right there. And it says, now we speak of God's secret wisdom. Get a hold of this. You know where wisdom comes from? The mind of Christ. And you know what? The mind of Christ is in total conformity with the mind of the God of all creation. Because he's not just the son of God. It's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. They're in complete unity together. And it says that, <clears throat> now we speak God's secret wisdom, a wisdom that has been hidden in that God destined for our glory before, the, before time began. No, or none of the rulers of this age understood it, for they... Had, for, for, they had, for if they had, they would never have crucified the Lord of glory. Now I can tell you that this goes on 
and it's fixing to quote, Paul is going to quote an Old Testament scripture here. But many times this is taught in a different manner. But I want to show you this is very much an Old Testament scripture. It says, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what the God what God has prepared for those who love him. And many times that will be taught, well, you know what, we can't know what all God's got for us in store. Yeah, we can. He's got good things in store for us. Good things. So you know what? When I take the mindset of this, you know, man, I just I just can't know what God's will is. Oh, yes, I can. But I'm gonna to draw closer to him to find out. It goes on and it says that no, no eyes seen, no ears heard, no mind, your thoughts, have conceived what God has prepared for those who love Him. But, here it is. That was an Old Testament word. Today, because we have a new covenant because of what Christ has done, it says because Jesus not only went to the Father after the resurrection, He went to the Father and asked Him to send you the Holy Spirit to take up residence within your life. And by doing so, you also receive the mind of Christ. It goes on and says, but God has revealed it to us how? By His Spirit. Revelation comes through the Spirit of God. It goes on. There's a lot we could go into this. I do need to see what... Oh man, we're good. It says, The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the man's spirit within him? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit. Are you dependent on the Spirit of God in your life? You better be. He's our teacher. We have not received the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we may understand what God has freely given us. What did you receive? What did you receive when you said yes to Jesus? It goes on and says, this is what we speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit. Expressing spiritual truths in spiritual words. The man without the Spirit cannot accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. And he cannot understand them. Because they are spiritually discerned. Now let me tell you something. There is a gift of discernment. And we may talk about that later on down the road. But right now you need to know what comes from God. The words and the thoughts that come, you need to know where they come from. Where they come from. And it says, the spiritual man makes judgments about all things. Did you, have you ever been talking to man and you... You know what, you Christians, you can't, don't judge people. What did I just say? The spiritual man makes judgments about all things. In other words, that's that spirit of discernment. You know what comes from the Lord and what does it? You know what, in that spirit of discernment, He's going to give you words of wisdom that you can speak life into the, you can see bondages into people's lives and you can, don't call out the bondage but speak life into that individual and give them, the, give them the resources that they need to stand firm in the truth of God's Word. And when you do, then you can call out those things. But you don't use those things that the Lord shows you to bring condemnation on people for there's no condemnation in Christ Jesus. Amen. But be Himself. But He Himself is not subject to any man's judgment. Get hold of this. For who has known the mind of the Lord that we may instruct Him? But we have the mind of Christ. What did Paul just say? He says, hey, I know that you guys have been taught all this, that there's no way you can understand what the God has in prayer, prayer for you. But he says, hey, we as born again believers have received the mind of Christ. We can know because the Spirit teaches us. 
leads us, guides us, directs us into all truth and righteousness. That's no bondage. One more scripture. Philippians. Too good to leave out. Philippians chapter 4, verse 4. Oh, that's three. Do what? Oh. Rejoice in the Lord always. When are you supposed to rejoice in the Lord? When everything's going right? Or all the time? When trials and tribulations come against you, what are you supposed to do? Rejoice in the Lord. Why? These trials and tribulations that come against you develop perseverance within your life. You can do that because He has also given you the peace of God. Peace is a gift. Don't put it on the shelf. I don't want to get tied up there again. But it said, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. You know, and I begin to see in that, this is why I asked you a while ago, some of you that are in sports or in a band or whatever it may be, you're doing something. Royce, you like to rope. Do you go to the practice pen? You do? Quite a bit? The more you go to the practice pen, the better you rope? Yeah, sometimes. <laughs> so, you know what? That's the deal. What are we supposed to do? Practice, practice, practice. Practice, practice, practice. Are you spiritually practicing the Word of God within your life? This is a renewed mind. That you know what? Every day I have an opportunity to practice God's Word. And you know what? If you don't practice, when it's time for the big game, you may not know the plays. You may not know what to do. You may, you may be running around with a lot of confusion going on in your life. But if you're practicing, you're going to know the play. You're going to know what to do. You're going to be in the right place at the right time. This is what the Lord's called us to do. So if I practice this word, I know that there's greater things to come. That's the hope I have in Jesus. It's an assurance of things that are hoped for. And then they become evidence of the things that are unseen. I couldn't see it, but I can now. I can now. He goes on. Rejoice in the Lord always. And I'll say it again. Rejoice. Let your gen gentleness be evident to all. Here it is. Your display of His splendor. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, with prayer and petition and thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. God set us up for victory. He set us up for victory. Now, you know, I know that there's a lot of things I'd love to continue to go on in this, but I'm not going to. But I want to share something else with you. And this is actually, it's actually a scripture that comes out of the Passion Bible. And I want to share this one. I told you one more scripture a while ago, didn't I? Well, I just got one more. So, <laughs> but here it is. This actually comes. What did I do? All right. This actually comes out of Colossians chapter 3 at verse 17. Now listen to this. And let this be a prophetic. You know what this word is? It is a prophetic word that God speaks over your life. When He tells us to do something, when He gives us a commandment, it's always to position us that He can exalt us. So hear this word. Let every activity of your lives and every word that comes from your lips be drenched with the beauty of our Lord Jesus Christ. The anointed one. And bring your constant praise to God the Father because of what Christ 
has done for you. Do you really believe that God set you up for victory? When? All the time. That's why we can stand with full assurance and say God is good all the time and all the time God is good. Let that be a foundation in your life. And quit thinking that when things come against you, that you go, oh God, I don't know if you know what's going on now. But we get that attitude sometimes. But not as much as we used to. There's a renewing going on within each and every one of us when we surrender ourselves to hear his word, to allow the spirit to speak to our spirit, to allow that renewing to go on within your heart. I just had a thought that would take me somewhere else that I don't need to go today. But let me say this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come and your will be done in the lives of everyone here, in the lives of everyone that's listening to your word, in the lives of those that surrender yourself, surrender themselves to you. Your kingdom come, your will, good, pleasing, and perfect will be done for your glory. In Jesus' name. Father, I know that there could be someone here today that's never accepted you as their personal Lord and Savior, somebody that's listening out there. But Father, I know that, Lord, that you, uh, you said that this is the day of your favor. You're forced, you're not against us. This is the day of your favor, the day of your salvation. Salvation is being set free from the bondages that come against us in this world. Father, we know that it is by the stripes of Jesus you said that we have been healed. Father, I know that you, you're the one that ushers in all good things. And Father, we also know that there's things that come against us. And we recognize those things, but Father, we don't let them have precedence in our lives. For Father, that's a place reserved for you and your word. So Father, where those things have come against us, if it be physical, if it be spiritual, emotional, Father, let our spiritual intelligence outweigh them all because our intelligence comes from you, not from the patterns of this world, not from man's teaching, but from your word. And your word is truth. You sent your word in the form of a son, Jesus. And Father, it's through him that we have life. In fact, your word teaches us that we live, we move, and we have our being in him. So Father, I pray for a spiritual hunger within each and every one of us to draw closer to you. For you promised that if we would draw closer to you, that you would draw closer to us as well, which means you would bring greater revelation that we may overcome the wiles of the enemy, that we may overcome the things that come against our mind. So, Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, I want to bind up a cloudy spirit in the mind. I want to bind up a spirit of Alzheimer's, Amen. and I want to release the mind of Christ over everyone that hears. For, Father, we know that you're the one that is the author of life. And you come that we may have life and life to the fullest. And for this, we're thankful. So Father, I stand today that if there's someone here that needs help with any situation in their life, Father, let us be here with the spirit of wisdom to give them a spirit that comes from your mind. Let us be the ones that, Father, that can reach in and we can impart the spiritual truths into people. For Father, we know that it's the truth that will set them free. Amen. 
I just can't say thank you enough, Lord, for loving us the way that you do. So let that love, let us learn to love ourselves better so that we can love others better as well. But Father, don't ever let anything get in the way of you being first in our lives. Seek first the kingdom of God, your righteousness, and you said there would be a great increase within our lives. All these things will be added. All the thoughts that come from you will be added. Lord, thank you for loving us in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Give somebody a hug before you leave. Pray with somebody.